स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया we have not defined what is meant by the logarithm of a complex number however if we have a logarithm of a complex number say log z then it is desirable that the derivative of log z is equal to 1 by z and by the chain rule we would like to have the derivative of log f of z to be f prime of z by f of z and uh, because of this uh, formal Uh, calculations which i just said we would like to use the terminology log derivative to denote f prime of z by f of z so let me just write that we will denote the log derivative we will denote by log derivative of f this is the formal definition that we are defining the meromorphic function so this is for f on omega the uh, holomorphic function and uh, the log derivative of f is on omega and that's going to be a meromorphic function and the meromorphic function is nothing but f prime of z by f of z so notice that away from uh the zeros of f this makes perfect sense this is going to be a holomorphic function away from the zeros of f and because the zeros are discrete at zeros this is going to have poles this is going to be hence a meromorphic function on omega now the log derivative is uh, well behaved and consistent with what we would expect so for example if uh, f and g are two functions on omega what can we say about the log derivative of f times g so what will we get if we look at fg prime by fg by looking at the uh, the the product rule we will be able to write this as f prime g by fg plus fg prime by fg so away from again uh, away from the zeros of f and the zeros of g so i'll not write that again and again it's understood this is being written wherever it makes sense and that's precisely equal to f prime by f plus g prime by g so notice that if uh, we did have a log this is exactly how log of f plus log of f plus log of g would be right the derivative of that log of f plus log of g is log fg and this this is in line with what would uh, one expect for a log derivative similarly if you look at f by g by f by g this f by g prime by f by g this is going to be equal to f prime g minus f g prime by g square by f by g which is g by f which is going to be g times f which is equal to f prime by f minus g prime by g again that's in line with what we expect because log of f by g is something like log f minus log g of course i have not defined what a log is till now so all these uh, references to log are hypothetical and based on our existing knowledge of the logarithm defined on real numbers positive real numbers we will come to defining the logarithm later but right now even if the word logarithm is not referred to at any point of time the log derivative can be defined in this manner and the log derivative satisfies these conditions these are the things to keep in mind let's look at what happens when our f and g are polynomials so consider a polynomial of the following type p of x to be equal to uh, say uh, a times z minus z1 up to z maybe z minus z1 to the power d1 times z minus zn to the power dn where z i's are distinct and let q of z be the polynomial maybe b times z minus w1 to the power e1 z minus w 
n m may be to the power e m. So, suppose we have two such polynomials where z i's are distinct and w i's are distinct, where z i's are distinct in the sense that z i is not equal to z j for i not equal to j and similarly w j's are distinct. So, w j 1 is not the same as w j 2 for j 1 not equal to j 2. Suppose we have this and we are interested in p of z by q of z, the rational function r of z given by p of z by q of z. So, away from w 1, w 2 up to w n, this makes perfect sense. This is a function holomorphic in, in that domain away from the zeros of q. And let us now try to find out the log derivative. The log derivative here is just going to be equal to then by using an induction argument one could argue that uh, r prime of z by r of z this is going to be equal to d1 time d1 by z minus z1 plus d2 z minus z2 plus all the way up to d n by z minus z n. This is in the case of the things which appear in the numerator and below this is going to be minus of e 1 by z minus w 1 minus all the way up to minus of e m by z minus w m. So, simple check you can actually uh, sit down and check that this is indeed what is happening using the two uh, checks that we have already done. Using these two one can very easily conclude that this is what is going to happen. When we described the uh, holomorphic functions initially, power series rather, we noted that there were many properties of polynomials which generalized to power series, which turned out to be uh, holomorphic functions. In fact, holomorphic complex analytic functions are uh, uh, locally having a power series expansion. So, many of the properties of polynomials generalized to, to holomorphic functions. And such uh, such a relationship holds between rational functions and meromorphic functions as well. So, we, we see that uh, when the rational function is of this type, our log derivative uh, is given here. Let us now try to see what happens to the log derivative of uh, uh, holomorphic function, how it behaves. So, let us consider the log derivative case by case and analyze what happens. So, to do that, let us start with some function f, which is defined on omega away from uh, set of singularities. Let f be a function holomorphic on omega minus s. Then suppose z0 is a point in omega such that uh, f is holomorphic on z0 in a neighborhood of z0 that is what it means to say f is holomorphic on z0 and f of z0 is not equal to 0. Then there is no confusion here f prime uh, by f is then holomorphic in a neighborhood of z0. So, in such points we do not have any confusion. Now, let us see what happens when uh, f has a 0 in z0. So, this is one case what happens when z0 is in omega. In fact, omega and z0 is not in s. Let us take the, that particular case. We know that it is and uh, so it is already taken care of here, we know that it is holomorphic. So, it was already in omega minus s anyway. So, this means that f is holomorphic at z0 and f of z0 is equal to 0 uh, with order m let us say. What does that mean? That means that f of z is equal to z minus z0 to the power m times g of z where g of z0 is not equal to 0. That is what it means. Uh, for z0 to be a 0 of order m. And then we have f prime of z is basically m times z minus z0 to the power m minus 1 into g of z plus z minus z0 to the power m times g prime of z. And when we divide it by f of z, we end up with uh, z minus z0 to the power m here. And here we end up with again the same thing z minus z0 to the power m and g of z. So, hence we get the log derivative of f to be equal to m by z minus z0 to the power 1 plus 
g prime of z by g of z and by noting the previous case this function is holomorphic on z0 let me say is on z0 to denote that it is holomorphic in a neighborhood of z0. So, notice that uh, it is something similar to what happened here. Here at uh, every point z1, z2, zn and so on it has a simple pole and the residue of uh, the log derivative of r at uh, zi is equal to di and the log the residue of the log derivative of uh, uh, r the rational function at wi's uh, it is going to be equal to minus of ei's when, in, when the pole appears the residue is minus ei and that is something similar that is happening here as well right at least in the case of zeros which we have just checked. There is a simple pole at z0 which is a 0 of f and the residue is equal to the order. So, we have in some sense using the log derivative reduced the problem of finding the order of a 0 to finding the residue of this particular function f prime by f. That is the case when we have f of z0 is equal to 0. Now, the case when z0 is in s and it is a removable singularity is very similar. So, let me not z0 be a point in s and z0 be a removable singularity. Removable singularity is a singularity which can be removed and after it is removed we uh, get a function which is holomorphic across z0. And because of that its behavior at uh, the removable singularity is exactly the way it behaves at uh, points of uh, points where it is holomorphic. Then uh, f prime by f uh, behaves as above. So, let me not elaborate there. It will have a removable singularity if it is the first case that when the extension does not vanish and it will have a simple pole when the extension of f vanishes at z0. So, that is why it is being referred to as above. The more interesting case uh, comes up, maybe not the more interesting case, but the interesting case will be when z0 is a pole and z0 be a pole of order m. Then what happens is that we have z minus z0 to the power m times f of z is equal to g of z where g does not vanish. g of z is not equal to 0 in a neighborhood of z0. And because of that we can write f of z to be equal to the meromorphic function g of z by z minus z0 to the power m. Then what will be the log derivative? Log derivative is going to be f prime of z by f of z which is going to be equal to uh, g prime of z by z minus z0 to the power m uh, minus of m times uh, g of z by z minus z0 to the power m minus 1 minus of m plus 1 this is going to be a minus m plus 1 rather uh, and divided by f of z which is g of z by z minus z0 to the power m. So, this is going to be equal to um, g prime of z by g of z which is just some holomorphic function minus m times g of z cancels off and what is left is z minus z0. Therefore, when z0 is a pole of order m where m is greater than or equal to 1, the log derivative of f is equal to a function which has a simple pole at z0 with residue equal to minus. So, we have, we have certainly considered what happens when uh, f has a meromorphic function in various cases that arises here. Uh, we have not considered all types of singularities of course, for example, we have not uh, addressed the case when z0 is uh, an essential singularity which in which case the behavior could be quite arbitrary and uh, when f is say identically equal to 0 the log derivative is not defined at all. 
So we have not considered all cases. However, we have taken care of all the cases which will be relevant to us in stating our next theorem which is called the argument principle. Let me state down the argument principle and uh, then we will discuss more about it. Let omega be an open set in, be an open set in C and f be a function meromorphic on omega defined on omega such that it has zeros at zeros of certain orders at z1 z2 up to zn such that f uh, has zeros of order d1 to dn f be a meromorphic function so let me just write that very carefully and f be a meromorphic function so it's defined on uh, omega minus some singular sets and let's see what happens zeros of order d1 to dn at z0 to or rather z1 to zn after uh, removing the removable singularities. So there are only finitely many zeros uh, with orders d1, d2 to dn here and sub, such that e1 to en and it has poles and f has poles of order e1 to em let us say at points w1 to wn wm so the setup is quite straightforward we have a function f which is defined on omega minus w1 w2 up to wn and uh, each of these wi's are poles with order e1 e2 up to em respectively and also f vanishes exactly at z1 z2 up to zn no other point does f vanishes and the orders are captured order of the 0 of f at zi is captured by di. So, this is our uh, function f. So, our goal in this uh, argument principle is to compute the zeros in some sense using the log derivative and in order to do that uh, let us pick a gamma be a closed uh, curve in omega which is null homotopic. So, closed curve which is null homotopic in omega such that the zeros and poles of f do not lie on gamma. Zeros and poles do not lie on gamma or the image of gamma rather. Then the conclusion tells us that 1 by 2 pi i times the integral over gamma f prime of z by f of z dz this is equal to uh, summation d i w gamma of z i where i is going from 1 to n minus summation j is equal to 1 to m e i w gamma of, e of w i w j rather where w gamma is the winding number. So, this is a, uh, a theorem where a combinatorial uh, question of counting the number of zeros and poles is being converted into an analytic uh, argument. So, by computing the integral of f prime by f over gamma, we will be able to compute the number of zeros and poles in the interior of uh, gamma. Let me just draw a picture to capture whatever we just uh, wrote. Suppose we have a omega in this manner and suppose our curve gamma is with the dark green. Suppose we have a curve like this and uh, suppose we have some points, uh, the points let us capture with zeros are being captured with blue suppose there are points like this 
z1 to zn in this manner and say pink is capturing the poles. Then our uh, theorem tells us that notice that only in this region will be the winding number non-zero. Outside this region the winding number is going to be zero. So, the contribution there does not come up. So, in this region whatever be the number of zeros and poles with the multiplicity can be captured by this integral. So, d i times the number of times it winds. So, in this case the winding number is 1. So, summation d i minus uh, summation e i is going to be this integral. That is what the argument principle tells us. Let us give a proof of this. The proof is quite straightforward. There is uh, nothing much to do here. We have already done all the necessary work. We can write f of z to be equal to z minus z1 to the power d1 up to z minus z n to the power d n by z minus w1 to the power e1 all the way up to z minus w m to the power e m times g of z where g has neither zeros nor poles in omega. g has neither zeros nor poles in omega. So, this is done by successively uh, using the fact that z i's are zeros and w i's are poles of uh, so, maybe an induction argument can help us conclude this and once we have this we will be able to write uh, our log derivative in the following manner f prime of z by f of z is just going to be then d1 by z minus z1 plus up to dn by z minus zn just like how uh, you would have computed in the uh, case when it was a rational function the same computation here will tell us that this is what we will finally end up with w m plus g prime by g g prime of z by g of z. Now, g prime by g is a function which is holomorphic on omega and let us now look at what our uh, curve had as properties. It was a closed curve which is also null homotopic in omega. So, if you now look at the integral, if you take the integral, integral of this is going to be the integral of this function dz and this is going to be equal to or maybe you can put a 1 by 2 pi i here to capture the uh, winding number that is the goal. The right hand side is going to be equal to 1 by 2 pi i times the integral of d1 by z minus z1 dz which is basically d1 times the winding number of the curve gamma around z1 up to dn the winding number of curve gamma around zn minus e1 times the winding number of the curve around w1 em times the winding number of the curve around wm plus the integral of g prime by g over gamma which by Cauchy's theorem is equal to 0. And this is precisely what uh, was written in the statement of the theorem. Notice this is precisely what is being written in the statement of the theorem. Now, if we actually explore the, the left hand side, if you look at uh, the integral of the log derivative of f over gamma one can actually check that this is in fact equal to the integral of f prime of uh, gamma of t. So, if gamma is defined from a to b, so consider gamma to be a uh, contour, a piecewise uh, smooth curve, then f prime of gamma of t gamma prime of t dt by f of gamma of t and uh, by the chain rule this is just equal to the integral of f composed with gamma prime of t dt by f of uh, f composed with gamma of t. So, define our curve sigma 
from a b to c given by is from a to b sigma of t equal to f composed with gamma of t and what we have just shown is that uh, let me put uh, 1 by 2 pi i's the above is just 1 by 2 pi i this is equal to 1 by 2 pi i integral over sigma d z by z which is equal to the winding number of 0 around sigma and we just showed that the winding number of sigma around 0 captures uh, this description of uh, the number of zeros and the number of uh, poles. A remark before we go further about uh, what happens when f does not have poles. Suppose f uh, is holomorphic on omega with just the zeros z1 to zn and suppose you take if you take a curve gamma, gamma be a simple closed curve in that case the winding number is either 0 or 1 simple closed curve which does not pass through z i's. Then the number of zeros in the interior of gamma simple closed curve null homotopic then the number of zeros in the interior of gamma where the image of the homotopy is defined in that particular uh, region the number of zeros counting multiplicities is equal to integral of f prime by f over gamma 1 by 2 pi i times the integral of f prime by f over gamma we just write that then 1 by 2 pi i times the integral of f prime by f gives the number of zeros of f counting multiplicities. In the interior, <coughs> in the interior uh, maybe I should just mention it this way in h of 0 1 cross a b where h is the homotopy from gamma to the constant curve. So, if you look at the number of zeros in that region, so if this is our curve, this is the region I am referring to in the interior of this curve, we will be able to capture the number of zeros by looking at integral of f prime by f. We will be using this very shortly in some really powerful theorems, but before that let me also state one theorem regarding the stability of zeros. The Cauchy's theorem tells us that if you uh, perturb our gamma to any other homotopic curve, then the integral is going to be the same and therefore, the number of zeros of uh, any function if you perturb our curve gamma a bit is not going to change, number of zeros and number of poles, the difference is not going to change. Similar is the case with functions f, if we perturb our functions a bit, uh, perturb our holomorphic functions a bit, I will tell uh, exactly what that means then the difference of the zeros and uh, the poles will not change. So, if you are focusing just on holomorphic functions and not bothering about meromorphic functions, the number of zeros will not change if you, if you change the function a bit. So, that is the next uh, observation which is going to be uh, about the stability of the zeros. So, let omega be an open set, let me just create the premise for you, let omega be an open set. and gamma be a null homotopic closed curve in omega suppose h so this is from a b into omega so suppose h from 0 1 cross a b into omega be a homotopy, be a homotopy, let us put a 0 here from gamma 0 to gamma 1, 
homotopy of closed curves. from gamma 0 to gamma 1. So, we now have two pictures, uh, two curves here, gamma 0 is something like this and gamma 1 is something like this. Suppose we have a uh, homotopy in this manner. Let us say that along these lines is how the homotopy goes. Of course, there are no holomorphic functions yet involved in this story. Suppose f0 and f1 are holomorphic functions on omega such that there exists a function, let us call this function capital F from 0, 1 cross omega, so there exists a continuous function from 0, 1 cross omega into C given by f of 0, comma, not given by such that f of 0, comma z is equal to f 0 of z and f of 1, comma z is equal to f 1 of z. So, we have a further suppose that uh, the zeros are well behaved. Suppose further that for all s uh, in 0, 1, we have the extra condition that f of s comma uh, h of s comma t is not equal to 0. So, notice that h of s comma t is just gamma s of t. So, the function it basically tells us that f of s comma dot, this particular function which is defined on omega does not vanish on gamma s. This is precisely what is being demanded, right? Gamma s is basically h of s comma t. So, in particular, uh, f0 does not vanish on gamma 0, f1 does not vanish on gamma 1 and so on. That condition is being, so basically, if for example, all the zeros of uh, uh, f0, f1 or rather for that f s for the f subscript s for that matter lies in this region, this particular uh, condition is satisfied, the condition in the hypothesis is satisfied. The conclusion here is that then the number of zeros of f 0 in the interior of uh, in the interior of gamma 0, Remember that gamma 0 is null homotopic and therefore, there is a homotopy which uh, homotopes gamma 0 to a constant path. So, when I say interior of gamma 0, one can think of as, uh, one can think of the interior as the interior of the image of the uh, homotopy which takes gamma 0 to the constant path. So, the number of zeros of F0 in the interior counting multiplicities. is the same as the number of zeros of f1 in the interior of gamma 1. So, notice that uh, the only assumption was about gamma 0 and gamma 0 was assumed to be a null homotopic curve and because it is a equivalence relation gamma 1 is also going to be a null homotopic curve and the interior of gamma 1 is also going to be defined in exactly similar manner as of now. We have not proved the Jordan curve theorem. So, the interior does not make sense if I do not make it precise. The definition of the interior right now is by considering the homotopy look at its image and that is the, the interior of that uh, image is what is going to be the interior and the theorem that we just wrote down here about stability tells us that the zeros of f in the interior of gamma 1 and the zeros of f 1 sorry zeros of f 0 in the interior of gamma 0 and the uh, zeros of f 1 in the interior of gamma 1 are going to be the same counting multiplicity. So, if you perturb our gamma a bit and if you perturb our uh, f a bit the zeros will not change. 
the proof actually even though the statement is uh, so big the proof is going to be extremely small so if you come up we will see that uh, the number of zeros this integral is being captured by the winding number of sigma around 0 right and uh, that is precisely capturing there are no eis here that will capture the number of zeros along with multiplicity so let me just note that down the number of zeros with multiplicity is of f0 in the interior of uh, gamma 0 is given by 1 by 2 pi i times the integral f prime of z by f of z dz over gamma 0 which we had noticed is the same as the winding number of sigma let me call this sigma 0 here of 0 sigma 0 around 0 that is uh, the number of zeros here and similarly the number of zeros of f1 with multiplicity in the interior of gamma 1 is given by w sigma 1 of 0 where sigma 0 is the composition of f with gamma 0 and sigma 1 is the composition of f with gamma 1. Now, the winding number is something which is preserved by homotopy. I am going to define now a homotopy from sigma 0 to sigma 1 and thereby conclude that w sigma 0 of 0 is the same as w sigma 1 of 0. Recall that the homotopy has to be in c minus 0. So, let me define a new function here g from 0 1 cross a b into c minus 0 given by g of s comma t is equal to f of s comma h of s comma t. Notice that we did put the condition that this is not equal to 0 and being a composition of continuous functions g is a continuous function and one can check that g is then a homotopy of closed curves in, um, in c minus 0 from sigma 0 to sigma 1 and that is going to ensure and because of that we have w sigma 0 of 0 is equal to w sigma 1 of 0 and that tells us that from star here and star star here we get that the number of zeros counting multiplicity is the same for f0 and f1 in the interior of sigma 0 and sigma 1 respectively hence we get the result so if you notice uh, all these uh, observations are actually very geometric in its nature so it's more easier to understand our setup by looking at the geometry than by looking at the uh, statement itself if you read these statements without trying to understand uh, what is happening geometrically it might sound a bit strange but once the geometric idea is clear everything actually fits uh, right in place so the stability can be captured by the following example let's look at uh, an example where our function f of z is equal to z square and gamma of t be equal to uh, e to the power i t for t in 0 to 2 pi. So, we know that uh, z square has a 0 at 0 with order 2. So, the number of zeros in the disk unit disk with uh, uh, counting multiplicities is going to be 2 here. Now, if you consider a function f epsilon 
of z which is say z square plus epsilon. Again these are all easy examples and it is easy to compute uh, the roots here. So, the roots are going to be what are what will be the roots here? The roots will be i uh, root epsilon and minus i root epsilon. So, for epsilon less than 1 this is going to be in the unit disk and again we have two zeros of uh, uh, multiplicity 1 each. So, the counting multiplicity is the number of zeros is 2. So, in this case we have not perturbed our curve, our uh, homotopy of curves is just going to be equal to h of s comma t equal to gamma of t for all s in 0 1. So, in the, in the previous uh, in the previous stability of zeros theorem and the perturbation of uh, the functions is what uh, was done. And of course, this is a very simple example, but then when we are not able to write down our functions in such a simple manner, we still have that the zeros are closed. A very, very powerful application of what we just uh, wrote down about the stability of zeros is to prove what is called as the Roche's theorem. Let me write down the theorem and prove it. Roche's theorem. Let gamma be a closed curve which is null homotopic in omega. Suppose f and g are functions holomorphic in omega and further mod g of z is less than mod f of z in uh, or rather on the image of on, on gamma. So, let me just write as on gamma. Then f and f plus g have the same number of zeros counting multiplicities. on let me just be precise this time 0 1 cross a b where on the interior of 0 1 cross a b where h is the null homotopy from gamma to a constant part just made the notion of interior precise. So, the first thing to note is that this condition ensures that both f and f plus g do not have a 0 on gamma, on the curve gamma. Let me give a proof of uh, Roche's theorem. The proof is quite straightforward now that we know uh, the stability of zeros. We will just define uh, homotopy or rather define capital F of s comma t to be equal to f of t plus s times g of t. Also uh, define our uh, oh, capital H I should not have used, so maybe I should use some other gamma, let me use gamma here. Capital H is what I will be using from the previous theorem define capital H of s comma t to be just equal to gamma of t. I am not going to change this curve at all. Fix that curve, the homotopy is hence going to be the same curve at every stage s. And now, if uh, we are to apply the stability of zeros, you can note that uh, h of uh, f of s comma h of s comma t is not going to be 0. Since f of s comma h of s comma t is not equal to 0, we have the number of zeros of f and f plus g in the interior of gamma are equal up to multiplicity. We will solve some problems based on uh, Roche's theorem and see how powerful they are.
in the problem set that follows.